area, and uh, the intersection of that with, with uh, conservation and, and, in particular, habitat destruction and deforestation. So I assume we're going to hear about some combination of, of those things uh, today. He also is a bassoonist in the Berkeley uh, Symphony cool. Orchestra, so he, he wears these two ha very different hats. And he's a man of many talents. I was interested to see on his CV that in addition to speaking English, he also speaks Spanish and German and Lithuanian. And Swedish. <laughs> and French. <laughs> French, not really. Not, not really, all right. <laughs> so uh, please join me in welcoming Ravinder to the MBC. Very, very flattered to be here that you're actually all here because I heard the number of seminars you're invited to every week, and it's just an honor to be here, and I'm very flattered to have such a big audience. Thank you for joining me. Um, like, I, like I just heard from Michael, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, yes, I was. Um, piano and bassoon major at Oberlin, and then I started at UCSF. I got accepted to this really impressive program at UCSF, so I went to school there, but I <laughs> failed my first year miserably. And I didn't even know what transcription was, and I just kind of got there. And, but then I, you know, I learned a lot of molecular biology and molecular, molecular and cell biology along the way. So basically, I would consider myself uh, fundamentally a molecular cell biologist. I studied neurons and uh, developmental neurobiology. Then I really wanted to do something bigger picture. I always wanted to do that. So I did my postdoc with Tom Smith at San Francisco State before I moved to UCLA. And I started getting interested in the birds and the ecology of disease. And so that's how this all formed. And so at that point, I really got a lot of bird samples. And we said, what can we do with these blood samples? And at that point, you know, people were just starting PCR with these things. And I had done PCR you know, from the very beginning. And so we started doing PCR and sequencing and getting a whole bunch of understanding of this diversity of all these different malarias in birds. And so that's what I'm going to kind of bring you up to speed a little bit about that. What is malaria in birds? Why is it interesting to us? What kind of things can we do with that system? How is that going to inform ecology of disease in general? So the title of my talk is Ecol uh, Avian Malaria in a Changing World. There's a lot of collaborators here. Of course, the professor doesn't do very much except give talks. <coughs> the uh, other people do all the work. And so these are my students at San Francisco State. We have some NIH money. We have USAID money, Lithuanian research money, um, National Geographic money. So it's always, of course, writing grants for lots of different things. So I'll talk about those. And then, of course, along the way, I'm going to talk about my collaborators at Cameroon, Vilnius, Lithuania, and, um, of course, UCLA, Rory over here and UC Davis. So a lot of really impressive people work on these projects with me. So I just want to acknowledge all their contributions, tremendous people. These are the people that work with me in my lab right now at San Francisco State. And I will not be talking about their work, but I will be talking about these people's work. So these are my students in Cameroon at the University of Buya. And so I have four PhD students and several master's students and some undergrads working on these projects in Cameroon. And they're just incredible. They don't have the resources like we do here. So remember every day that you look at the internet that you have internet. These people don't have internet. These kind of things really make a difference. Always take advantage of every opportunity that you have here because they really want to and they can't. And so those are the, these people are tremendous scientists, work in the field four times a year for three weeks each time, going to the jungles, catching the birds, catching the mosquitoes, identifying all these things. And this is right after we got out of the jungle. I'm smiling because I knew there was a picture. Everybody else is like, oh, God, that was a hard trip. <laughs> so <laughs> we just got flooded, and uh, there's a lot of stories. So what is malaria? Here, I'm going to talk a little about human malaria. Still a billion people infected. Um, 200 million people every year. Mortality is about 500,000 right now every year. This is an interesting quote to me. About half of all humans who have ever lived on the planet have died from malaria. I don't know if that's very true or not anymore, but this is an interesting thing to at least think about. Lots of people die from this disease still. Um, you remember that there's a mosquito stage for malaria. There's also the liver stage in humans and vertebrates, I mean um, mammals, and then we have the asexual and the sexual cycles that, of course, I can teach you if you don't know the malaria life cycle. But remember that there's a very, very complicated life cycle where the parasite undergoes many changes through its life cycle. 
Um, one more thing is that remember that people get malaria, but you know you're not always symptomatic. So I just was pointing this out. I was talking with um, I was talking with you just about this, about how a lot of people may think that they're free of malaria, but actually have it. So here about prevalence of malaria, 80 percent, and the proportion of malaria infectious that are asymptomatic is also very high. So remember that PCR now is a different way of detecting malaria, where you actually detect the um, people that are infected but don't even have symptoms. Okay. That's humans. Look at this. Here is Plasmodium falciparum that affects humans. There's about five um, malaria that infect humans, right? And these are the these are the ones that are in primates. But if you look at all these blue ones here, those are the bird ones. So malaria is basically a bird disease. It's really found mostly in birds. All these blue guys are birds. We have some lizards, we have some bats, we have some rodents too. But the greatest diversity is in birds. That's why it's super interesting to study this, because there's diversity. There's also different vectors here. We've got mosquitoes, of course, for plasmodium. There's another one called a biting midge that spreads parahemoproteus. And then um, these, we also have hippobosids, and we also have black flies that spread leukocytosome. So they're malaria relatives, but the diversity is very high, and it's a complex <coughs> system. What I like to say is that birds are infected with many of the same diseases as humans, like malaria, but we don't have the cultural and socioeconomic things that humans do. There's no bed nets to put over them. So that's why it's interesting to study the ecology um, of these diseases in birds, because it's a kind of honest system. You can't really do this with humans as well in many cases. So when we're studying deforestation in birds, it's going to be different than studying deforestation in humans because the humans have, you know, artemisinin and drugs. Okay. So we all know that habitats and climate are changing. I won't go into this. This is basically where we've been working. I've done some work in Alaska, California, Costa Rica, and a lot in Africa. We know that environmental change is affecting human diseases, such as onchocerciasis, leishmaniasis, Lyme disease. We have examples of environmental changes affecting a lot of different pathogens. <coughs> so deforestation. This is what scares me. You always hear about climate change, a lot about climate change, but deforestation is rampant, right? And in some ways, more problematic than climate change. Look at this. 5% of most sub-Saharan nations are losing, we're losing 5% of their forests every year. That means in 20 years there's no more forests, okay? <laughs> so that's the problem. Only 23% of the forests remain. This is the impenetrable forest, um, in, in windy impenetrable forest in Uganda. And basically it's an island. That's where the gorillas live, in this little <laughs> island here in Uganda. And so there's agriculture all around it. So our concern is now, what is this deforestation going to do? And also, I want to mention also that this palm oil industry is growing rampant. It's just growing almost exponentially in some places. There's um, Indonesia, of course, but we also have Africa, and it's growing in Africa, too. So this palm oil industry is leading to deforestation. And so here we have deforestation, and we're talking about birds. So global climate change, of course, deforestation contributes to global climate change. Microclimates, biodiversity, immune health, vector ecology, trafficking, migration patterns. This is all going to affect the ways that infectious diseases are being transmitted in birds. So you probably know, I mean, how many of you have not been to Hawaii? I'm curious. Everybody's been to Hawaii. Most people have been to Hawaii. But the birds you see there are um, not local native birds, right? So what happened was in 1826, there was this boat that came from Mexico. It's called the Wellington. This boat came from Mexico, came to Maui, and dumped its water in the Maui streams. And along with that were these, you know, mosquito larvae. So there were never any mosquitoes there before, right? And so all of a sudden, now there's mosquitoes in Hawaii. And that, of course, changed everything. So along with mosquitoes came malaria at some point. We don't know exactly the timing of this, but probably in the early 20th century, possibly. And so here you see some of the birds. We lost um, 23 of the 71 bird species. 30 of the remaining 48 are endangered. It's called a virgin ground epizootic. This is a mosquito on an avapane. This po'o'uli went extinct in 2004. And here's an e'ivi. So they're basically limited to the tops of the mountains now, where it's too cold for mosquitoes to survive. And so a lot of people are studying avian malaria in Hawaii. 
because a really nice system where you have one mosquito type and one malaria type, and you can really monitor the birds well. So it's a very, very nice system for this. But I get into much more complicated stuff, where we're looking at many species and many birds and many habitats. So I wanted to point out that plasmodium is the same as humans. We also have hemoproteus and leukocytes. So there's a lot of species of these things. These are the kind of diseases that affect birds. These ones are called the hemosporidians, order hemosporidians. So those are the ones that are intracellular blood parasites. Okay? And they're spread by different vectors. Here is the parasite. You can see, I want to point this out now, because you can see here's a nucleus of a red blood cell. Remember that birds and reptiles have nuclear red blood cells. And so here you see the parasite inside the red blood cell. Okay? And here you see a hemoproteus inside a red blood cell. And here you see a leukocytosome inside a blood cell. And they're spread by different vectors, black flies, mosquitoes, or biting midges. So they're related parasites, but they're spread by different vectors. Okay? You can stop me if you have any questions along the way, of course. So what happens when you get a disease in these birds? It's a little different than humans. You don't get fever. So humans, you get a fever, of course. Um, you get the symptoms usually 7 to 20 days after infection. This is based on lab experiments. Hypertrophy of spleen and liver, they get bigger. And then lower hematocrit, fewer red blood cells. So this is some of the repercussions of these parasites in these birds. So yes, there are uh, effects of the parasites on the birds. In many cases, the birds lay fewer eggs, so there are fitness costs. But often, we think that in many cases, they don't really affect them. So Hawaii was a different situation. Those birds had never seen these parasites before. But here in California, Alaska, Africa, South America, they typically don't die. Unless we see them early on, there might be some cases. But generally, they have chronic infections that are lifelong. Remember that each parasite affects each bird differently. And that's the problem. Remember how falciparum kills humans, but you know, ovale and thyvex are not as lethal. So there's differences, even with the human parasites. Remember that. So each parasite has different effects on the birds. One more thing, remember in human malaria, they go to the liver first, the sporozoites from the mosquito. Here they go to the endothelial cells, so slightly different in the life cycle, just to point these things out. So we've collected samples in a lot of places. Actually, Rory contributed the ones from South, America, uh, South Africa and Tanzania, but we've collected a lot of samples in all these different places. And I get to show you some of the beautiful birds that we get along the way, because I just love these, these guys. This is a chestnut flank sparrowhawk, a beautiful blue-breasted kingfisher. This is one of my favorites, and it's a beautiful call in the forest. Some of you have probably seen this bird, the emerald cuckoo. This is one of our target species, yellow whiskered green bull, and drop it as lateralis. We get a lot of this bird. So it's easy to get in this nets. So we get many of them. And this is our main target species, the olive sunbird, which Rory is one of the world's experts on this bird. Because it's easy to catch. You get it all through um, Central Africa, and it's um, very common to to catch and find. Here, here's some of our it treks into the forest, and here is how we catch a yellow whiskered green bull in a mist net. We ban them, take a blood sample, and then release the bird. Here's our last trip when everybody was coming out. We got flooded, so we had to cross this one tree to get out of the forest. <coughs> Not an easy trip. Oh, and here you see some black flies feeding on another um, exhibitor. Oh, and here's a snake that tried to get in my tent. <laughs> a green mamba, I think it's a green. I'm not sure, the herpetologist would know. Um, we're talking about newly described species, post-specificity of habitat, deforestation and prevalence, post-parasite coevolution, molecular basis for post-specificity and pathogenicity. I'm not going to talk about the work in Alaska or the hummingbirds or the woodpeckers. So I'm going to try to get through some of these really interesting topics that we can address studying bird malaria. So first of all, we have thousands of blood samples. I think it's more than 20,000 samples at this point from many bird species. What we do is we take the DNA sequences, basically it's a barcode, cytochrome B. We take this barcode, 
and link it up with the morphological blood smears. And so we see the blood smear, we see the sample, we see the parasite on the blood smear, we link it up with a certain cytochrome B barcode, and we put it into databases. So there's a database <coughs> called Malavi that's um, a worldwide database of all these cytochrome B sequences. All right. Um, so we identify a new ones. These are from Kelly. I was just talking to, who was I talking? Yes, I was talking to you about Quelias. This is one from Molymbicus. Here we have some new, I'm not going to point out the features. This is very specific little details about the morphological features of these parasites. But we can identify new parasites under the microscope and link them with the cytochrome B. So we're finding a bunch of new parasites. But when we get to this deforestation, this is our main interest here. We thought that when we would cut down the rainforest, we would see higher prevalence of infectious diseases in birds. It was a very simple premise, of course. Um, so basically, you cut down the forest, and here you would have a constant level of um, parasites, and maybe in some forest patches you'd have more, and in some patches you'd have less. So what we did is we took remote sensing data and linked it with our parasite data. So predicting the prevalence with remote sensing data. So we take all these different um, variables, land cover, <coughs> moisture, uh, temperature, rainfall, MDVI as a measure of the greenness of the forest, and put it into some of these accent of modeling programs, and we get the um, epidemiology of the parasites. So this is our avian malaria heat map in West Africa with the olive sunbird. So here we have collected <laughs> olive sunbirds across this whole region and basically get a heat map for the um, prevalence. And so it's one parasite and one bird again. So this is actually a very nice system since we had caught only that particular bird. And so if we had done this with a whole bunch of different birds, it would be a little bit more complex. But this is nice because one species of bird. So here you see Nigeria here. And this is Cameroon. Here's some of Ghana, um, Cote d'Ivoire. And you see the heat maps. And this actually links very nicely with the human heat maps as well. So when you're looking at human malaria, it's almost identical to this. And um, probably because of mosquito habitat. This is not taking into mosquitoes into account. This is just birds and the parasite. So what we wanted to do then is understand a little bit about deforestation and what's happening and how's that going to affect the parasites. And so what my student Tony did, he went to paired sites. Okay? He went to paired sites. One was deforested and one is undisturbed. So basically disturbed and undisturbed, disturbed and undisturbed, disturbed and undisturbed. So he catches these birds, um, the olive sunbird and the yellow whiskered green bull, at all these different sites. And we're looking at what happens side by side, the same, same rainfall, same kind of temperature patterns at these sites. And so we thought that, again, we would see higher prevalence of malaria in these disturbed sites. It was more complicated, of course. And so we see some parasites went up and some parasites went down. We have no idea about the mosquitoes at this point, or the vectors. At this point, we're just looking at the prevalence of the parasite, and we see some species going up and down. For example, this megaglobularis one is higher in the undisturbed, and then this plasmodium lucens is higher in the disturbed. And this was statistically significant when we looked at these different sites. OK, so now we have no idea about the mosquitoes at this point. So then we went and started collecting the mosquitoes, trying to figure out which might be the vectors for these parasites. So we found out that there's a bunch of them. We um, identified Coccolotidia as a genus that spreads malaria. We already knew Anopheles and Culex and Aedes, but also Mansonia is one that is transmitting these parasites. We do this by dissecting the mosquitoes and looking at them and looking at the cysts in the mosquitoes and showing that they are actually um, infected and transmitted. Transmitting. Then we have a bunch of birds. These are our main species that we catch with this nets. Of course, we're not catching the high-flying birds and also the big birds. And so these are our typical low-flying mist net birds that we catch. So now a little bit about this host specificity too. Okay, so <coughs> some parasites are host specific and some are generalist. I'm going to bring this up because it's interesting later on. So, <clears throat> so using some Aurori samples, this is in Tanzania, the Highlands. This is the Finbos in South Africa. And this is our samples in Cameroon in the, the low-lying um, rainforest. So 
what will we think? So we've looked at a bunch of these samples, and we're we use this um, specificity index. So it reflects the taxonomic difference um, between hosts and the number of hosts, in which has been observed. We got a bunch of samples, screened a bunch of birds. So we're looking at identifying how are these parasites. Some of them are specific. They are only in one species of bird or in one family of birds. Other ones seem to be jumping a lot. Those are the generalists. And so we're trying to figure out what kind of habitat effects have on the specificity. And so it made sense when we looked at this. So the rainforest, you would affect more specific parasites because the, there's a tight ecological association and the birds and the mosquitoes, the mosquitoes find the birds. Where on your highlands, right here, over here, you have a higher index of host specificity, meaning more generalist or lower specificity. So when you're in the highlands, the mosquito can't always find its bird. So it's going to generalize. Okay? And this was a little bit in the middle, the thin boss the habitats. But here, if you're thinking about in the highlands, you have a variable habitat. The mosquitoes are not going to always find the right bird, so the parasites generalize. Kind of makes sense. Same with the restricted and generalist parasites. So if you're looking at a bird that has a really big host, a uh, big habitat range, so here's we're looking at some birds that have immense ranges, like the olive sunbird. And so with those ones, you have, again, lower scores, meaning more specific, because the parasite can find its host. Whereas if you're a very um, low habitat range, Again, the parasite is going to be more of a generalist and have these higher specificity indices. Does that make sense, everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that I just wanted to bring that up because you have the sense that these generalist parasites are the ones that are more variable habitats. And so when we're talking about deforestation, we're predicting that these ones will be more dominant over the long term. With ancestral reconstruction analysis, the rate at which generalists become specialists is more um, four times at the rate at which specialists become generalists. And so we believe that over evolutionary time, these parasites want to specialize. Okay. We have lots of lineages. So these are our parasite lineages in Africa at this point. We have a lot of different diverse parasites. This is just Plasmodium. So this is not including Hemoproteus or Leukocyzo, which are even more diverse. So this is just the Plasmodium lineages. And we can see, again, that some are found in very disparate regions, like PV12. Look at this one. It's all the way down here, it's all the way <laughs> over here, very different regions. And so we're interested in some of the evolution of this. Um, some parasites are specific to specific regions, like these ones seem to only be in mountain lowlands. These ones are in rainforests. So where does the structuring happen? We think that there's taxon pulsing, basically. So you have with the vicarians followed by the, so you have um, you have vicarians followed by redistribution, vicarians redistribution, and so I think what's happening here is there's a lot of combination of the plasmodiums and the birds overlap as well. So here we have a bunch of different sunbirds overlapping in their territories, and so we they can jump from host to host, and they can when we have a vicarian event they get separated and then they um, redistribute, and we have a this kind of huge diversity of malaria parasites. So host switching plays a significant role in the dispersal and diversification of these parasites. OK, so now that was the background to the big project that we're doing now. All right, so the palm industry is cutting down the forest, and it looks like this afterwards. So we go to Cameroon, and I was lucky to meet a group of people. I was searching for exactly this, the region where they're cutting it down, where they're having um, we can monitor exactly in real time when is this all going to happen, and then we can predict if this is going to. We're going to see the forest cut down next next year, and so we go there before it's cut down, during, and after. <coughs> and so this is what we're seeing. Um, so our hypothesis is this: that the generalist parasites will dominate after the deforestation. And so, like I was saying before, here you have a black mosquito and a red bird. Here's a green mosquito and this colored bird. So in the pristine forest, there's this tight association. But when we get these destruction of the forest, there's an ecological release. And so 
this green one will suddenly say, oh, I'm, I couldn't find my regular bird, so I'm going to feed on the red one. And then we have a new red bird, a red mosquito that's come in, and it can start feeding on other, on other hosts, right? And so we think that what's happening with this destruction, you're seeing mosquitoes feeding on other birds that they don't normally feed on. And that would lead to this generalist parasite phenomenon. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So here we are. So this is in Cameroon. We're working here and here. So this is the area that's being cut down. And so we know when it's going to be cut down. We actually, it's being cut down right now. And so we've collected a lot of samples here in this rainforest before it's cut down. And we're also collecting at the edge, because this is a really interesting spot at the edge. Because at the edge, we'll see how far does it affect the remaining um, birds inside this habitat here. And so we're really interested to know how does deforestation affect the malaria inside the remaining forest, and then how does it affect the mosquitoes and the birds inside this forest that's getting cut down. So it's a really unusual system. Actually, this is the first time that anybody's done this, looking at mosquitoes in real time with deforestation. So it's a compelling system. It's a tragic system because you see this horrible um, deforestation going on at, at, while, you're, while you're there. This is Heracles Farms. It's a, it's, a, it's a joke, basically. But they're basically planting all these palm trees. And we believe that this is prime ground for um, new mosquitoes, like Anopheles and Aedes, that are human transmitters. And so along the way, we're also monitoring when do the human biters come in. And it's actually quite fast. So just a couple months after the forest is cut down, we're finding AEDs already. And that spreads dengue and Zika. So this is what it looks like afterwards. I have a little video to show you what it sounds like. So here, you can see the edge see. Oh, it's not working again. of the forest. With it on the right side here, this is supposed to come this will all be gone to All right, so this is the trees that are going to survive on the left side over here. And then on the right side, this is all going to be cut down. And so we're monitoring just at the edge here um, and catching the birds and the mosquitoes right at the edge. And so again, we're also monitoring the birds and the mosquitoes inside the forest that's remaining. And uh, yeah, so here we have a nest, and you, uh, nest, and you can basically see how it works. The main point is that we're looking at the edge and the interior of the forest that's cutting kind of down. We don't need to stress this very much, but it's all very much demarcated. And that's the kind of scary but interesting part about this experiment. Anyway. So right, these are our collection trips. So, <laughs> We've got a lot of samples now from um, the forested areas. And so now we're collecting them after the deforestation. <coughs> so it's, we were at the same site, and then now it's cut down at the same site where we were before. So it's um, like that. So now, so we have a bunch of samples. We, those students go out uh, four times a year, three weeks each time. And we have thousands of samples. So we have about 12,000 mosquitoes. And we're using multiple trapping methods. CDC traps, sweep nets, all these different trapping methods for mosquito experts. <coughs> we're trying to get the huge diversity of mosquitoes inside the rainforest. And then we're also monitoring when does Anopheles and Aedes arrive in the deforested areas. We have thousands of birds, mostly from these dominant forest species, but we're noticing, of course, the uh, deep forest birds, are, we're losing them very quickly. So we had some um, very interesting uh, wattle eyes and unusual birds that we don't see anymore because they're just gone. And so diversity is decreasing substantially after the deforestation of the birds. But the olive sunbird, the alifi, and the yellow whiskered green pole are still um, in that forest region that's left. 30% of the birds are infected, so we have preliminary results. I'm not going to show you, but we're getting more of the generalists. So just like we're predicting, we're seeing more of these generalist parasites in these birds that are um, remaining. And so that's 
you know, compelling, and that's showing that this is leading to kind of emerging diseases, because the generalist ones, like the Hawaiian ones, that was a generalist parasite. So that's our work with that. Um, so again, that's ongoing. We're going to get all the final results by next year and then put it all together, the mosquitoes, the parasites, and the birds. Um, deforestation is resulting in altered prevalences of parasite lineages. So I think I've covered all this host switching and the biogeography is really important for the diversification. All right, so that's the field component of all the work, but we're also doing a large amount of molecular work in my lab as well. So we're interested in, again, what is causing this host specificity? Why are there specific parasites and why are there generalist parasites? What are the molecules involved? Why would some parasites have certain qualities and not others? And so the first thing we did was sequence um, the avian malaria in chickens, and that's Plasmodium gallinaceum. So I remember this is the hard thing. The cells are nucleated. So that means you get very much bird DNA and very <laughs> little parasite DNA. That's why we've been having a huge problem getting genomes of these things. Actually, just now, after many, many years, there's finally the true genome of Plasmodium gallinaceum. <clears throat> but it's not very, it's still not complete. And so what we did is instead of doing the genomes, we're interested in the transcriptomes. Because the thing is, if you think about our blood cells, we don't need nuclei, right? So these birds have nuclei, but they're not doing as much as the <coughs> parasite in terms of making mRNA. And so we believe and we get pretty good transcriptomes because the bird's nucleus is not doing that much. And so we get the RNA from Plasmodium species, we get uh, the complete transcriptome, and so we assign it to different biological processes. I can't, you can't see this, as, but this is cellular processes, developmental processes, uh, locomotion, metabolic processes. So we can categorize the different genes that we get. And then we're looking for specific parasite genes. And so, for example, we're looking at Mabel, which is a gene involved in the parasite getting into a red blood cell. So that's one of the ones we found. We're looking at um, MSP1, which is another, we're looking at AMA1. So AMA1 is right here. This is a gene that's, again, involved with the parasite getting into the red blood cell. And so we know these genes from human malarias. And so we can find them in the bird malarias. And we're finding that there's actually less diversity of these genes than in the human malaria, which was interesting to us. Like in the Plasmodium gallinaceum, there's only one Mabel gene. This is the gene that's involved like, for getting the parasite into the host cell. So we've identified some of these erythrocyte binding ligands, reticulocyte binding like homologs. There's a bunch of genes, if you're a malariologist, that you would know what these are, that are important for getting the parasite to bind to the red blood cell. And so we're looking at those. Um, again, identifying um, method methodological difficulties are, are hard in this case. But, um, but this one was an interesting one, this Mabel gene. We found that it's very conserved. Um, we have conserved amino acid composition, and using you know, all of our different methods, we can see that this is a really interesting EBL gene, and there's only one that we found in these bird parasites, whereas this is a big family in Plasmodium falciparum. So I think what we're coming down to here is an early mechanism of invasion. And so we're interested in these early kind of fundamental processes of, the, of host invasion. AMA1 is another one that's involved for invasion of the red blood cells. And we know that with human systems, if you block AMA1, they can't get into the cells. So we're identifying these. And we're looking at why our, our biggest interest here is what genes might be important for the um, host specificity. So we know that this plasmodium lucens is found only in olive sunbirds. We haven't found it in any other bird. So that parasite is specific to olive sunbirds. It's not even found in other sunbirds. Really interesting parasite. And so we're looking at the genetic variation of AMA1, and we find slight unusual differences in the protein structure um, when we're looking at this plasmodium lucens AMA1 versus some of the other ones. And so we have hydrophobic regions that are conserved, and I will show you here that this little bit here has specific insertions in this um, protein structure. And so the next step is, of course, to do some kind of 
lab studies where we'd infect birds with this protein and alter the protein and see if it changes the specificity, that's a little bit downstream. But we're just trying at this point to identify uh, these um, genes that might be involved in host specificity. Another thing is pathogenicity. So this parasite, Plasmodium circumflexum, is, you know, the birds don't die from it. We put it into a canary, the bird's fine. This other one called Homo circumflexum, when you put it into a bird, the bird dies. <coughs> canary. And this was done in the laboratory with our colleagues in Lithuania. And so what we're interested in now is getting the transcriptomes from both of these and identifying, using digital subtraction, the virulence genes. And so that's our next step, and we're along the way doing this right now. So we have a transcriptome of Homo circumflexum. Our circumflexum transcriptome is not very good right now. It's, again, very hard to get these. So um, we're getting another one called Delachoni. We have the Hemoproteus columbae transcriptome. So we're trying to get a good sense of these different genes, their functions. And I'm saying that this is interesting in birds here because um, doesn't go backwards. Because these parasites are really related. If you look at falciparum and vivax in human malaria, they're very different. They're not really related at all. But these parasites, the homo circumflexum and the circumflexum, you can't even tell them apart on the microscope. They're very similar to each other. And so that way we can identify genes that might be involved in human malaria that we just haven't thought about before. And so that's our underlying, that's you know what we're doing for NIH. Um, and then finally, one last thing <coughs> before I close up for questions is this Hemoproteus columbae. We have a transcriptome of this one. And this was a parasite that was really <laughs> difficult to place in a, phylogen in a phylogeny. And so, for example, here, this Hemoproteus columbae, which affects pigeons and doves, um, it just, there was no good support for where this is placed in this early phylogeny based on cytochrome B and stuff. And so now we have 601 proteins and 17 taxa and put it in here and we can get a better sense of where it goes and we find that it's the hemoproteus is monophyletic. <coughs> so we have a monophyletic of the hemoproteus genes, um, the hemoproteus parasites, which makes sense. So they are different from the plasmodiums. This is a minor point, but something that we wanted to resolve just for the field to know where this parasite is placed. I think that's all the things I wanted to talk about with today. I think there's a lot of questions that are in your mind probably, so I'm going to welcome those. We have ongoing projects to really understand the vector ecology associated with the deforestation, um, the transmission of parasites in California songbirds. We also have a woodpecker and a hummingbird project with avian pox ongoing. We still don't know what the mosquitoes are in Alaska that are transmitting the parasites. So basically, we found that we do have transmission of malaria in Alaska at high, al high latitudes, but we don't know what mosquitoes are doing with. So, Kind of these things that we're interested in. There's plenty to talk about, and I welcome any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you. It's very complex, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, so my first question is um, in, in relation to palm oil. So. I was wondering if you have any colleagues that are working in Indonesia where you kind of have a mix of early stage and late stage fragmentation. So like if you were to look at New Guinea where there's really not a lot of palm oil plantation happening versus uh, throughout Indonesia where most of the forest is fragmented. I'm wondering if I really don't have an, I haven't even looked into that. Okay. So if you know somebody, please let me know because yeah. this Cameroon thing is there's plenty of palm oil in Cameroon too. And so, I mean, this system, it could, have, it could have been coffee plantations, it could be whatever. But we wanted to find a system where we know where the forest is going to get, <laughs> cut, get cut down at a certain time. So we can go there before. And actually, nobody's ever done this because to get permission from the palm oil plantation was hard. Right. So we had to get in there and we're kind of surreptitiously telling them that we're going to, you know, tell them that, well, maybe palm oil is good for malaria. You know, we're just telling them stories. <laughs> and so, so, um, so we can't really reveal this, and we're not talking to Greenpeace or all these other places, too, because, you know, there's a lot of controversy about this. Next question. And the, the, the other question is, uh, I wonder if some of the disjunct distribution of uh, similar strains could be explained possibly by migratory birds? 
Yes, that might be another explanation. So yes, there's some migration, and we know that between Europe and um, South America, I'm sorry, Europe and Africa, we get some migration, and also, for example, there's a leucocytosome in the orange bill nightingale thrush in Costa Rica that we find in Swainson's thrushes that migrate. And so we know where that parasite is transmitted because the, the bird that doesn't migrate has that same parasite. And so we can kind of tell by the migratory versus the non-migratory birds where that parasite is transmitted. Yes, yeah, definitely possible that there's transmission based on migration. I think if you, um, if you drink a, a liter of palm oil a day, I think you pretty much can't get malaria. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, my question is, maybe you explain this, but I'm curious to know, in, inside of any bird species, um, can they be infected by multiple kinds of um, malaria at the same time? The question is, do you have multiple infections in one bird at one time? Yes. That's confounding. So yes, we're getting... I didn't show that, but yes, and often we have hemoproteus, plasmodium, leucocyzone, other parasites, trypanosomes, nematodes, all in one bird. And is that related to pretty strongly with fitness and, I mean, mortality of birds and the more different kinds of parasites you There have? have been a few studies on that, and yes, you have um, additive effects. So if you have more than one parasite, the bird is more compromised. And do you think that's more likely in um, uh, more deforested areas where there's more generalized parasites, or does the, the parasite diversity itself go down when you have deforestation making multiple infection less likely? You know, this is something that we haven't analyzed yet, yeah. but I think we are still finding some multiple <coughs> infections in the, the birds that have survived the deforestation or along the edges. And so I think we're still finding multiple infections. It's very, very common to find multiple infections. Yeah, thanks. Question. Um, so you said you were in statistical state reconstruction analysis. You showed an evolutionary trend towards Post specificity. Yes. So, what do you think explains the propensity towards post specificity um, since it seems to be more advantageous to be a generalist according to your work? Right. So, this is a really an interesting phenomenon. So, over evolutionary time, the parasites want to specialize. That's what we're seeing. And it makes sense in a way because the parasite wants to survive in the host, and the host will. You know, this red queen hypothesis where the, there's constant, this constant interaction between the immune system and the parasite, immune system parasite. So they come to an agreement after some time and they kind of co evolve and live together. And that way the parasite knows it has a stable environment to survive. It will get transmitted. Whereas the generalist is going to get into some bird that might kill it, right? Or it might kill the bird and not transmit as easily. So it comes down to the R knots and the modeling of that would be really interesting to work on. But yes, I think over evolutionary time, it makes sense for the parasite to specialize because it has a stable place to live where it knows it will survive. Make sense? Yeah. That's my thinking only. Question? Two questions. One is, in the forest, is it possible that there are, are features about the forest that help limit the infection? For example, barks or some, some such thing. And yeah, I think this is really interesting. So, are there are there use are the birds using chemo, um, you know, disinfectants for their nests? And I think we have some evidence for that from, you know, ectoparasites <coughs> at least in North American birds. That yes, they choose barks and stuff to reduce the number of ectoparasites. I'm not sure if that's happening in the forest. I wouldn't be surprised if there was something like that going on. It really makes sense. Yeah, next, you were going to ask something else too. I, but we have no evidence for it. We don't know. Okay. And the second question is, is if, can you look at a genome for a parasite and say, this, this is going to be human and this is going to be avian? Yes, okay. absolutely. The human parasite is very different than the avian parasite. So and it's, of course, much easier to get the human one because there's no red blood cell nucleation. So the human parasites have all been sequenced a long time ago. And now we're finally getting some sequence information from these bird parasites. It's tough. It's very tough. So yeah, there's certainly a different question. I was wondering when you were testing um, like the mosquito prevalences, are you testing only adult mosquitoes or also kind of breeding grounds? Since we're testing as much as we possibly can. So we're getting we're going inside the little barks and scooping larvae out from the little standing water in each bromeliad. We're looking at everything that we can possibly find. We have a whole team of mosquito team that's going out there trying to get the larvae, trying to get the egg rafts, trying to get as much as they possibly can, rearing these egg rafts in the laboratory, in the forest, to see what mosquito larvae pop out. 
So we're trying to do everything that we possibly can. We have a whole team of mosquito people. It's really amazing. Have you seen like really different species in the standing water and deforested areas versus the standing water in the forest? That information is not in my mind right now. Okay. They might be seeing that. I just don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. I don't. But um, I think again, we're getting again mostly adult mosquitoes. But the hard part is identifying. So there's no good key to these mosquitoes in Africa, so we're developing new keys to these mosquitoes. And so what's really nice about my students there is that, you know, they're trying to do molecular work, but the basic thing that they're learning is really good taxonomy. And so they will be the mosquito experts of West African forests, and they're developing new keys for these things. And that's the tremendous thing that is going to be their legacy. And I think it's just exciting to have, they can't compete with us in terms of molecular genomics and everything, but they're going to be the best at identifying mosquitoes. Ravinda, are there yeah. resistant mutations in mis in birds? We don't know. You mean like a like a um, a sickle cell anemia kind of thing? Yeah. So in humans, <coughs> there's so many different genes yes, in which mutations yes. confer resistance right. to have, plasmodium. We really don't know. So the question is, are there resistant genes like sickle cell or hemoglobin or? Um, these different mutations which humans have to give resistance again. We have no idea about that in birds. It'd be really nice to study that, but we don't have any information on that at this point. Different, it's interesting because the same <coughs> parasite, if you put it into a starling, it doesn't kill the bird. The same parasite you put it into a, another bird, the bird dies. And so again, each parasite has different effects and for some reason the European starlings get out pretty good. <laughs> 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 Yes, any more questions? All right, let's thank, thank you very, you very, very much. much.